Thank you so much. I did include in your newsletter the ACEs scoring you can do for yourselves. We're going to talk about that a little bit in, in a moment. Um, there are some uh, issues around that for some people, the scoring, depending upon where you are. Remember, we're going to be talking about worldview. And as you shift uh, your worldview, things come into focus differently. Um, so let me introduce quickly Suzanne. And I'm just going to, to, I'm going to let her tell her story, but remember, we're here not just to explore the development of this idea of kindred activism together and with your help, but really because, as you can see, many of us have been here for a while doing this work, and we need you. We're looking for people to hand the baton to. <laughs> You know, and as we talked about in our orientation, this idea of cultural creatives and the social work that was done, the social science work that was done by Paul Ray and Sherry Anderson, <clears throat> I sent you that article, same uh, planet, different worlds, uh, cultural creatives who are interested in shifting into a more holistic, sustainable way of living are, have two challenges. One is visibility. We don't see each other. And we don't want to be visible because it feels dangerous. So you can stand right beside someone in your office who might share the same worldview, but it feels like it would be inappropriate or, or scary to talk to them about how you feel and really think about things. So visibility is a challenge. And then, of course, kindredmedia.org exists because we've been trying to help get the new story out there, gather up thought leaders, and feature some of these uh, pioneers uh, for, for years now, for decades even. So visibility is a problem. And then the, uh, the other piece is coherence. And this piece cannot be underestimated. As you, we will launch into this discussion now. I just ask that all of us uh, take your notes, um, do deep listening, because this is going to be complicated. We have the worldview of the United States, which does not even recognize attachment science. And we have the worldview of uh, Scotland, a country that does and is oriented in, in attachment science. And so when, when the idea of ACEs and trauma landed in these different countries, there have been different responses to them. Um, so uh, again, I will, here's my story about Suzanne. I'll tell you uh, now that you know that we <laughs> the, the, the real double secret purpose of having this program is to have you uh, catch that baton we're throwing your way. In um, 2010, Kindred held the first Mindful Motherhood Conference at the Museum of Motherhood in New York City. And after the conference, someone came up to me and said, you need to know about that Suzanne Zedike over there in Scotland who's done this great film called Connected Baby. And I said, okay, I'll find her. And I did, and we did an interview. And in that interview, which is still up on Kindred from 2011, you can hear Suzanne telling me then, and I keep saying, what are you, are you saying you went to the police departments and talked to the police about attachment science? <laughs> she just blew my mind, the thought of trying to do that um, in my own you know, state or, or country. I, I, was, I was fascinated that there was receptivity to that. Piece. So Suzanne has been occupying this space for a very long time, and I cannot wait to uh, also introduce Carrie, but we're going to hear from Suzanne now about her work. Lisa, Dave Reshma, thank you so much. All of you who are here, I am delighted to be with you and to have this conversation. Um, and if we can find ways to have more and more people be part of this conversation and to lead their parts, I'll be delighted. Um, and I can't wait to hear what Carrie has to say either, but we decided that I would go first because it might help you to hear the story of somewhere that none of you are. So I know all of you are in America, but lots of you are. And so I think that sometimes it's hard to see in your own culture. And so hearing the story of somewhere else or some other time, sometimes sounds so weird, like Lisa just said that, um, that I was talking to the police department then, and, um, and our police department, not, not all of them, but there's a whole strain, whole, you know, section of our police force in Scotland that absolutely talks attachment. So if that sounds weird, I'm delighted because that lets you go, what? And then maybe that will generate questions and insights 
that when we come back to Carrie, who's talking from an American perspective, it, it will help to frame it in a different way. So that was our goal. And I will love it while I just talk for 10, 15 minutes at the most. If you have thoughts or questions, please put them in the chat because I'm actually happiest when there are lots of voices in the room. But what I've done is I've put together a little PowerPoint um, presentation that has n almost no words in it. They're just images because I suddenly thought it might help you to, to see this more clearly if I added in some images. So basically, this is my story of me and most importantly, of Scotland's ACEs movement or trauma movement, which I have ended up a, an important voice in. Uh, and I never set out to make that happen. So I'll just tell you all of this and then maybe we can have a bit of a chat and then we'll hear Carrie's to add to this. Okay, so this is me, um, what I wanted to be when I grew up. So this is me as an academic in the University of Dundee here in Scotland, where I spent 20 years. And that big arrow is my office. And this is what I wanted to be when I grew up. Now, you can tell from my accent, I'm originally American, but I've now been here for 30 years or more. So I'm sort of half and half now. But so, so this is me as an academic. And what I learned for over those 20 years, plus my graduate work, was over all that period of time, I came to understand that the things that I knew about infant development and about attachment uh, and about child development, I came to understand the rest of the world often didn't know. So teachers didn't know, childcare staff didn't know, police didn't know, social work didn't know. And this became a real moral problem for me because I couldn't figure out why we were doing science of babies if the people who spent time with babies and children and human beings didn't know that stuff too. And so about, about a decade ago now, I took a really radical decision and I decided to resign my academic post and to try to translate this, what I call the science of connection for the public. And that's what now motivates all of my work. And I'm happy to come back to it. It really became a moral question for me. Um, and, and it wasn't anything I ever envisioned because I thought I was going to be an academic, perhaps in that same office for the whole of my career. And I had no idea how you would do that. So it's actually, it's 11 years ago, uh, this week actually, since I uh, officially launched what I was trying to do. And I popped this picture in for two reasons. One, because this provides a link to that first conversation I had with Lisa. So the first time Lisa interviewed me, we were talking about the launch of this documentary film that I had made called The Connected Baby. Um, and, and so when we launched, people came to see this film about babies interacting with their parents. And if you would like to see that, it's on the website. You can now get it in DVD or streaming. That wasn't even around really 11 years ago. But so this is to just give you a sense of some of the ways that I set out to think, how do you help people to understand babies' capacities and how important relationships are and how mammal, you know, that this is mammalian, but it's particularly primate, which is exactly what you were just talking about, Dave. How do you help people to do that? And one way is you show them films of babies and you help them to see how amazing they are and how we come wired for connection. Okay, so over COVID, I have conveyed that because I'm now, a, so I have spent the last 10 years, 11 years, speaking to audiences about this, translating all that science. And I think it's amazing. It's a huge privilege. <clears throat> okay, over COVID, we can see all sorts of impacts on, from families on infant development because families have been much more tense. And so one of the ways that I've tried to help us to think about that is with this image. So this is a baby born during COVID. That has a really strong impact on people to go, this is a COVID baby. 
This is one of those real babies born really in COVID. I wonder what life has been like for him. And this image, Daniel, is 30 minutes old. And I have this image because the pet, because mom, that's Kelly, and Brian, who's not in the picture, have come to understand enough about the science of attachment that when they saw this early picture at 30 minutes old of Daniel looking into his mom's eyes, they understood something really important was going on here and they sent it to me. So I thought I would share this with you because it, the little story behind it is a sense of what happens when people begin to get this. They were excited. They understood that Daniel was connecting with them and something was going on in his brain here and that this was wiring his stress system and they felt proud that they understood the significance of this moment. And I think it is amazing that I get sent things like this because it's an affirmation that people are getting it. And then on social media, I play that up, I celebrate that, I talk about how confident they feel, and then other parents want to step into that too. And it helps that it's a real baby and a real mom and I can tell a story about them. Okay, <clears throat> but what we particularly wanted to focus on tonight is the ACEs movement that has grown up here in Scotland. So here is my story of that, which I have been involved with from the beginning, even though I did not know that that was gonna happen. We have a, a major ACEs movement going on here in Scotland and I date that grassroots movement, that public movement from 2017 in the summer. We don't have a PACES connection like Carrie is gonna talk about in America. And of course, PACES has now reached internationally. So we don't have something that functions quite like PACES, but I think this is the closest thing we have to that. So in 2017, my little tiny organization, which is called Connected Baby, teamed up with another tiny organization called Reattachment to show the new film that was coming out or that had just come out from um, KPJR Films called Resilience, which is about the science of ACEs. And we had known that it was coming out. We are two of the people who speak to the public a lot. And we wanted to see if we could show that film. And we only ever planned to have one screening of it. Turns out you can rent a movie theater. I didn't know that at that point that you could do that. But we put up on Facebook that we were planning to have this event and you could buy a ticket. And then the most bizarre thing happened. It turned into an explosion. And so this is what we call our tour poster of that summer. We ended up going around 25 communities in Scotland and about 2,500 people came to them. And you can see that almost all of them are sold out showing this film. Because what happened is that people got upset with us. Because when we put it up, and that we knew we were onto something important. We put up on Facebook that we were going to have this screening. They sold out in about three days, the tickets. And then somebody said, wait a second, can you not come to Edinburgh, which is another city on the other side of the country, which is like an hour and a half apart. Can you not come to Edinburgh? And we went, oh, well, we hadn't thought about it. I guess we could. And then those tickets sold out. And then somebody said, but wait a second, why can't you come to Dumfries? And why can't you come to Lennox Town? And before you know it, we had people who were pissed off with us, who were angry that they couldn't get tickets because the tickets kept going like that. Okay, the reason I'm telling you that story is we had no idea that was going to happen. No idea. And we had to cope with it. We did our best. And stepping into the opportunity that emerged, first of all, it made us very, very tired over that summer. But secondly, kicked off a grassroots movement that has changed the country. And it was never predicted. And if I told, if I have one insight that for me comes from my story, it's that I never predicted most of what happened. Okay, so if you keep it open-ended, and you respond to the opportunities that emerge, I think that's good enough, even if you don't have a really clear plan. Okay, so people come and see this film, they then find out how can they get a copy of the film, how can they take it back to their community, how can they get their 
uh, city government? How can they get their business to buy a copy of it? Because lots of people decide they think other people should know this too. So here's the next unbelievable thing that happens. Um, a colleague and I, who you'll see in just a bit, named Pauline, runs an organization called Tigers. Uh, we said, do you know, I wonder if we could have an event, like maybe 500 people would come, maybe, maybe Nadine Barcaris, who was in that film, maybe if we asked her to come and speak, she would come. We didn't really think she would, but we thought it was worth asking. Did she not say yes? Oh my God, things went crazy. 2,500 people came over the course of two days to hear Nadine Barcaris speak because they had seen her in that film. They wouldn't have come if they hadn't already had a sense of her. She's really dynamic in that film. People wanted to know more from her. We had no idea this was gonna happen, but this is, this is a little bit of what looks like when you put 2,500 people in a room together. And people came from all over. So this is really multi-sector and people chose to be there. We were astounded. Okay, so that happens in 2018. We call that ASAWARE Scotland. What if, um, could we have the world's first ASAWARE nation? What would it look like? We gave it a really bold title. What would it look like if every single member of Scotland, citizen of Scotland, understood about ACEs? That was the vision. And so what if you had an ASAWARE nation? Interestingly, that's now how this is really referred to, is as ASAWARE nation, almost more than ASAWARE Scotland. Okay, well now we are on a roll. People said, when are we having the next one? The next one was in 2019. This is 2,000 people in a room together with a different keynote speaker. This is Gabra Mate. But because we were rolling from the energy the year before, people wanted to come and talk about addiction. This is me taking this photograph at the top of it going, oh my God, how do we get all these people here? Just hiring a building that big is terrifying. Are you gonna sell enough tickets to pay for it? But that's why I wanted you to be able to see it. Okay, so then it's 2020. We think we'll have another event, COVID comes. So we have a conversation series where the public can come and we invite speakers and we do it online. And we'll have it in 2021. Except in 2021, we were still all having COVID. So we continued a conversation series and all of these are up. You can watch any of these if you like. The point is we were trying to figure out how to do this. We were making it up, we were being responsive, we didn't have a plan. Then it's 2022. COVID's passing a bit, if COVID is passing, I don't know if it's passing, but this is the event that we just had earlier this month. This is 400 people in a room together, that feels pretty big at the end of COVID. And the topic of this event is compassionate prison. So 400 people from well out with the prison community came together to talk about ACEs and to think about compassionate prisons. And when, and when you have part of that event sponsored by things like uh, flooring companies and insurance companies and uh, bookkeepers, you know something different is going on. Okay, now the reason we wanted to talk about compassionate prisons was one, we could have a big international speaker. We had Fritzi Hortzman at that event, but we need to talk about compassionate prisons. So if you're excited that we're talking about prisons, I'm delighted, please be excited. But we need to talk about that because Scotland has the highest population rate in uh, the UK and it's above average for Europe. Why are we putting all those people in prison? America could ask the same thing, okay? And Scotland has the highest rate of drug deaths in Europe. This is major for us. So there are big arguments that go on about do, do people understand the link between addiction as self-soothing, use of drugs, and therefore tons of people in prison, of course, are on drugs or have a history of drugs or carry lots of trauma, but our treatment programs don't really take sufficient account of trauma. So there's a big group of people who are really angry about this, quite rightly. And so we need to talk about prisons and drugs. 
So on the one hand, it's celebratory, and on the other hand, this is dreadful. Okay, so I tell some of that story in one of the pieces I suggested that you might read that um, was published last year. And you'll see that I worked really hard at the title I gave it, The History of Scotland's Aces Movement, Grounded in a Focus on Relationships. And I think this is where we have been really successful, I'll come back to that in just a second, in keeping a focus on relationships rather than on scoring or diagno diagnosis or numbers um, about which there is some controversy. So keeping relationships at the center of it is I think one of, is probably the strength of the Scottish ACEs movement. So if you wanna know more about that, I attempted to tell this story in an academic piece where that story has never been told before. And if you want to know more about the things I've just talked about it, we have a YouTube channel. It's now got 100 videos on it. This is an image from them. You can follow along with lots of what I just talked about. Here's the thing, we never planned to do that. One day I thought, how many videos are on our YouTube channel? Turns out there's nearly 100. I don't know how that happened. We just responded to what was possible. And as I said a minute ago, one of the things we often say is relationships are key, relationships are key, relationships are at the center. We've been successful in doing that. And I think part of what Carrie will tell us in a few minutes is that she thinks that has not been so successful in America. And one of the reasons I think we have been successful in doing that is because of the people who have ended up helping to lead this. One of them is me. I'm a developmental psychologist. I'm trained in attachment. So of course I brought relationships to it. But I think other, I think if you're in Scotland and you're part of the ACEs movement, you take this for granted. You take for granted that relationships are part of it because it's how we have framed it. And that's how we talk about it. So people don't think this is significant. They just think it's obvious, but I know it's not obvious. Okay, so I, sell, I totally celebrate this. How have we, how can you see that? How have we done that? Well, <laughs> this is the bag that gets used at all the Ace Aware Nation conferences. So there are thousands of people wandering around Scotland with a bag that says on it, believing in the transformative power of compassion. We actually lifted that from Nadine, but it's one of our strap lines. And I like, sometimes you run in the street, you know, in the street you run into somebody who's carrying one of these bags. Here's another thing we did. These are our quote badges. And I thought I would just show you so that you would have some sense of how we have managed to do this. So we have a quote from, a quote badge from every speaker who has spoken at any of these conferences. And so now we have quite a collection over the three conferences because there are multiple speakers at them. And so we ask a speaker to give us a key quote, and we make a badge out of it. And then attendees can take away those badges with them. But you can see here, if you can read it, the number of people who talk about relationships. That's just the quote they give. Okay, so now the most amazing thing happens. People wear these on their lanyards. So if you're employed as a teacher or in public sector or as a social worker or anywhere in Scotland, you have to wear a, a basically an ID tag around your front to allow you into buildings. People now wear these on their lanyards. So here you have a set, it, I went to a conference and this was somebody who had them and I said, please can I have a picture of your quote badges. I tweeted today that I was coming to see all of you and I tweeted that picture. I said, I'm gonna tell them about the quote badges. And, and somebody else tweeted back to me this. She tweeted me a picture of her collection of quote badges. And I can see some of your faces smiling. Okay, I'm glad I put it in. This is now just kind of standard for people who are part of the movement here. 
They show off their quote badges. They trade them almost like baseball cards. We had no idea that was going to happen, but these have become kind of badges of honor where people show they're part of the movement. And now we always have them at a big conference. It doesn't look like very much, but it has, it has made a really big difference to people. They wear them really proudly, like on their jackets and okay. But as I start to head up toward winding up, I want to tell one more part of the story. Where did this all begin? It did not begin in 2017. In 2017, we had this big explosion of the grassroots movement. And there are now, I think, hundreds of thousands of people who will have heard about it and who consider themselves part of this movement. But it actually begins in 2005 with these two cops, <laughs> or at least members of the police department. So this is John Carnican and Karen McCluskey. They worked for a police department and they began to get tired of um, locking people up who were in gangs. They weren't shooting each other, but they were knifing each other. Glasgow was known as the basically the knifing capital of Europe. And they wondered if there was some other way to do this other than locking people up and then locking their children up. And they, they got curious, they started asking around, and eventually they were allowed to set up something called the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit, and they learned about babies. And they have had a seminal impact on the thinking about the importance of relationships here in Scotland. So they started in 2005, and so we went from 2005 to 2017 until it exploded. So that's, you know, more than a decade. We had no idea it was going to explode. Lots of us just kept going around the country talking about this stuff. If you want to know that story, that's told in this video. It's in the things I recommended to you. And this was me making a film with them to talk about the origins of it so that other people can know that story. Because the other person who was really important in Scotland is Sir Harry Burns. He was the chief medical officer here in Scotland for nearly a decade, at the same time as John and Karen. I think this was crucial. It was an accident. It wasn't meant to happen. But because John and Karen and Harry all had some, some positions of influence, and they all happened to be working at the same time, and they all got interested in relationships, Together, they had this seminal impact. And Harry Burns used to go about the country talking about love as the chief medical officer. Talking about, um, he used to have a PowerPoint slide that was called um, the chemical structure of a cuddle. And so when your chief medical officer talks about attachment, talks about ACEs, talks about cuddles, people listen in a different way. And I believe if Harry and John and Karen had not happened to be there all at the same time, we would not be here today. So there's something about looking for the, f and sometimes you don't know until it's the past. We didn't, when they put this together, we didn't know how important that was gonna be. But looking back, uh, we, it's now clear that this was crucial to Scotland, <clears throat> those two people. And so when I talk about adverse childhood experiences, which Carrie's going to talk about in a minute. So the, the ACEs study, this is often my slide, right? So there's the ACEs triangle and Harry Burns. Because the way Harry told this story, when you get to the early death part, so if you have scary experiences in your childhood there at the bottom, it changes the way you develop, it changes how you cope, it changes smoking and drinking and alcohol, it changes disease, disability, and it leads to early death. So Harry would say there are, there are areas of Glasgow where the average rate of death is 54 years of age. And then everybody would gasp while he made it real. Of, you know, Glasgow is central to, to Scotland. That's not Philadelphia. 
or Los Angeles, that's Glasgow. And then he would say, we will not solve that early death problem by anti-obesity or anti-smoking campaigns. We will solve that by the way we love our children. So he used strong language to, that was a bit unusual coming from what you might have thought a chief medical officer would use to really to talk about this. Okay, so as I really do wind down, <clears throat> This is where it has then been taken up. So this is the Scottish government. This is one of their programs of work. This is them talking when they project future, what are we gonna do for the next year? Part of what they talk about is ACEs and trauma. This is the um, director of public health in one of the areas. So their 2018 annual report was talking about adverse childhood experiences and they talked about intergenerational trauma in their area. This is a book published by a woman named Carol Craig in which she talks about the trauma that is hiding in plain sight in Scotland. Lots of people have now read this book about Scotland. This is Darren McGarvey. He made a television program just this year where he's talking about addiction, especially Scotland's addictions, the highest drug deaths in Europe, the addiction to alcohol. He talks about ACEs. This is our musical called The Little Iceberg, which we just finished having the first run of. It's a metaphoric story. Lots of families came, lots of children in schools came. It's a metaphoric story about what happens with trauma when you cover yourself with protection so that nobody can get close. That came on the back of the children's book that we published during lockdown that I will talk to Lisa about possibly publishing. But what I mean is by the time you're doing a children's musical and people understand that it's about trauma, something different is happening. These are our lawyers. So we have lawyers who are now doing lots of work pushing. They've run an award for their work on trauma. This is our sentencing council. They have now changed the sentencing for young people. It has to take account of a trauma background and brain development up to the age of 25. This is Pauline and Tigers. She runs an organization with apprentices for young people, some of whom are construction workers. So they now take an awareness of trauma, mindfulness to construction companies. Pauline and I together have put together a program we call Daring Ventures. Dave, I put this in while you were talking. This is a circle of security. Daring Ventures is a phrase that comes from John Bowlby this summarizes the whole of his attachment work, life is best organized as a series of daring ventures from a secure base. What Dave just described to us were baby primates making a daring venture, going out and then coming back to secure base. So we now have construction companies that are understanding attachment and thinking about how childhood experiences of attachment are influencing the likelihood that their employees will commit suicide. And I think that when you have construction companies that are interested in that, for me, that feels like this major achievement. And finally, my last example, as I really do stop, is Patuka East Primary School. We have lots of schools that are interested. I was at their school today, because it's 11 o'clock at night with me. I was at their school today. Here's me. And I told the children that I was going to be talking to America, and they all went, ooh. We were recording films for schools, talking about trauma, talking about exactly the things I'm talking about here. That's the head teacher, and that's the interview David Cameron. That's their janitor. Their janitor is trauma-informed at Patuka East Primary School. And so he understands that the relationships he makes with children have an impact on their brain and body. <clears throat> this is the head teacher dealing with a behavioral issue. And she said to those two boys, I was in a room at the time, she said, okay, so you've made a mistake. What will we do about it now? And they decided that they should go back and apologize to the teacher. So in other words, she hasn't given them, she hasn't reprimanded them. She's done it in a relational fashion. And I thought I would end with this. 
These are the teddy bears that sit in her corner. And they sit there because she understands trauma. And so one of the things I have done, last slide, is this is my book. And in that book, I tell lots of these stories that I've just told you. Because I have learned that when you tell stories about putting this into practice, then it helps to push it because that means if real if other schools can do this and other parents can know this and other police departments can do this, it makes people ask, why are you doing this too? In other words, it is a choice. And I hope it's been helpful to see that because it gives you a sense of how far and how broadly this is spread. But one, we have a lot more work to do. And two, guys, we never planned it. It's just what happened. And I have learned to trust responding to the opportunities rather than getting frustrated by the plans I had that didn't come to fruition. Lisa, I know that was longer than I promised. I hope that was still okay.